Good morning, Kim. You in good spirits? Well, I am. It's uh, the second day of spring, and it's only 34 degrees, and they're talking about cold rain this afternoon. I'm, I'm getting tired of the weather, but other than that, things are going okay. Well, that sounds like a beautiful day to me, I mean, compared to what it could be. <laughs> I want to tell you what happened. This is really a conversation, Kim. But I got a call from Becca. Becca, you know who you are there in North Florida. And she asked me why bees inside the hive were eating some of her bees and tossing out the partially eaten remains. What was going on? I was caught off guard. I wasn't prepared for the question. I did the best I could. And believe it or not, that question's had me thinking ever since then. I've done some reading. What do you know about this so far? Well, I've seen it um, here in my yard once and in somebody else's yard because they called me over to ask me what was going on. I've seen it a couple of times over the years. And both times that I saw it, what was going on outside the hive was kind of driving what was going on inside the hive. And what was going on outside the hive would have been a tremendous spring flow. Ah. Just, just wonderful. And a storm moved in, and it snowed for three days, and it stayed below 30 for three more. Well, now, that's a lot of information. I, you clearly <laughs> don't mind talking about this, so <laughs> let's go with that. Hi, I'm Jim Tew. And I'm Kim Flatham. And today we want to talk about cannibalistic bees. It's really a bright, upbeat subject for the second day of spring on a cold day. You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, hosts Kim Flottam and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world. Get ready for an engaging discussion to delight and inform all beekeepers. If you're a long timer or just starting out, Sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. I don't know what to say, Kim. I I thought about this subject ever since she brought it up. You know, it's this bees eating bees is always just casually mentioned and then glossed over. But there's no other word for it other than cannibalism. And, you know, this, all the book chapters, when you're getting down in the dirty and the parts of the, the depth of the information, it'll say, well, yeah, under the right conditions, bees will eat the young larvae because it's just a food source to them. Yeah, we, we agree with that, and we move on. But I want to ask you, Kim, if this were any animal other than bees, would we be as placid about it? If I had a dog and she was eating her puppies, uh, the, that would I'd take a dim view of that. <laughs> Help me out here, because this is not a bright, cheerful subject, is it? It's pretty, it's pretty unseemly. Seems like. Well, there are there are some people who take that to the extreme, I guess, and they kind of say that small children are meant to be eaten, but. <laughs> No, that's not what people say, Kim. (laughs) The only reference I've ever had to it, I've never looked it up. So I'm I'm, I'm going on hearsay, and the hearsay came from Dr. Roger Morris at Cornell when early back in when I was running the magazine. And he told me in two short sentences, there's not enough food. They're getting rid of the young so they don't have to feed him. Next question. And that was like what you said. Yep, you know, that's that, it. That's, yep. that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Is that information scant because it's it's despicable, or is that information scant because we don't know a lot? I'm thinking it's the latter rather than the former. Yeah, I've, I, I can't get. I can't imagine getting a PhD in entomology. Um, why parents eat their young in a beehive? But but uh, so I don't know what Roger said to me made sense. There's you you have to make a choice and you can feed the kids. But if this food shortage continues, you're going to run out of food and they're going to die anyway. 
So do you get rid of them? Because then you've still got a queen and you've still got nurse bees that can take care of the next flush of brood whenever. Yep. Well, it, it just gets worse, Kim, because the bees select the brood that they're going to repurpose as food, and they keep other brood. So it's like some bad movie where if, where some offspring are kept and other offspring are used as a food source to repower the brood food glands to then go feed the siblings with what had heretofore been their offspring. <laughs> this just gets uglier and uglier. So, yes, I agree. I mean, I, the, uh, there is, there's a lot of work done. If you look up cannibalistic bees, hunt, ca- cannibalistic honeybees, there's work that's going on right now, has gone on, and yes, it seems to be related in many cases to a pollen flow or lack of a pollen flow. I don't know what happened in Becca's bees, but since she was already well into spring, I suspect something disrupted the protein supply and the bees outran, outran what they had available to them, so they turned to eating the young larvae and in some cases, the older larvae, because the investment has already been made in the in the pupae. There's no nothing to be gained by by killing them. They're they're close enough to being mature adults as to be useful, and they leave the eggs because there's been no investment made in that. So it's like, well, we call it a bad bad decision on the weather. We don't have enough pollen, so here's our food reserve. It's all we got in the cupboard are these young bees, so we will repurpose them and start over again as soon as the weather changes. Shoot a hole in any of that, because this is conversation. This is not lecture. (laughs) Well, what you brought up on eggs piques my interest. And it it would be interesting to know if had she looked in a hive were there eggs there? Now, you just mentioned eggs with no investment, and that I hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, but in three days, they're going to be an investment. So are there eggs in a hive when that starts, or, or do eggs go at the sa- or way before that or at the same time? I don't, and I don't know that, but that would, be, that would be a good thing to know. I think in general, eggs are spared. It is three days, but three days in the spring can be a radical difference. The rain stops, the plants retool. Now, I've said several times, and I'll say it again, I'm making this up as I go along. This is conversation hypothesis, not factual information. So there's that. The other thing that has to be noted is when I did that this quick read, just to see if any work was done on cannibalistic bees, it is a unique way for virus invaders to spread inside the colony. So this is a totally separate subject. Maybe the bees in Florida were not protein-starved. Maybe they were, in some case, virally infected, and the bees were throwing them out. And normally, hygienic behavior is a good thing, but in this case, it kind of bites the bees in their bee butts because by eating virally infected larvae, Then they infect, apparently, their brood food glands, and then they become spreaders of the virus throughout the colony. Kim, this is just from a quick read. This is not a literature review. This is just a quick read. Boy, I hadn't thought of that either. Let me bring up another question. Before you do that, Kim, let's take a break, because we're just tumbling all over ourselves here, telling things we don't know for sure. Let's take a break, catch our breath, organize our thoughts. We know you have options when it comes to shopping for beekeeping supplies. What we believe sets Better Bee Apart are three things. First, our commitment to innovating, trying out new products in our own apiaries, and then sharing them with you. Second, our focus on education and helpful customer service. And third, but not last, our fundamental company goal, to help you be a successful beekeeper. Give us a call to learn more about any of our products or to ask a beekeeping question. We've got you covered. Visit BetterBee.com to shop online today. Okay, Kim, I feel better. Go ahead and finish your comment now. (laughs) Well, she said they were partially eaten. And I wonder, 
Because when I talked to Roger, he didn't mention eating. He just mentioned getting them, you know, discarding them. You pull a larva or a, you pull a larva out of a cell and stick it outside. It's pretty much dead. You don't have to kill it. So I wonder if if her larva were being eaten by the bees inside. And I, I'm guessing here. I just don't know. But if they are, if they were eaten, why didn't they eat all of all of the larva? I don't know. Are you talking <laughs> hypothetically? Maybe they did eat all of the larvae. Maybe they just ate selected larvae. So I, I guess I would weasel word that. Sometimes, depending on the direness of the situation, they eat everything. If they're really starving, other times. It may be a worker here and a worker there who makes the decision. Kim, there's also some of the uh, quick papers I read was that workers may decide that this particular developing larvae is undernourished, not performing, not developing, for whatever the reason, and take it out. Kim, I, I want to stop right here and say you've referred to eating. I've referred to eating. The literature refers to eating. I don't fully understand the mechanical procedure that a worker bee does to actually eat a larvae. Since they have to almost imbibe their food, drink their food, how are they actually eating anything? They don't have little bee teeth. So are they just taking out body juices? Or are they in some way liquefying the body tissues that they can so that it's drinkable? But we always make a reference to bees eating bees, but I don't see the mechanical process. I don't understand the mechanical process for doing that. Is that why the larval skins are thrown out? Well, you just brought an image to mind here for a moment. I can just imagine a, a nurse bee sticking her head into a cell with a, larva, a small larva in it, regurgitating a big load of honey, biting off the larva's head, stirring it around with her antenna, and drinking it up a, a honey cocktail. Uh, <laughs> nah, <okay. laughs> but I'm thinking, I would go a different way. I wonder if she's regurgitating saliva. Is she using enzymes? Listeners, we're making this up. I want to be crystal clear that this is just Kim and me talking with with ourselves and you. So I, I suppose, in light of not having studied the literature, that this is a, a short, quick digestive process. And it's the reason they're not always thorough. But in, in this discussion, questions beget questions. If this is a food source... Why don't robber bees invest more time in actually destroying the brood also, or do they? And I just hadn't been looking for it. I've been watching for robbers taking the honey, and I didn't notice the fact that some of the robbers also kill some of the edible food-grade larvae. So how did, how did this eating thing, you know, if, if robbing is an issue and everybody's out there pilfering and stealing— why don't they take all the food inside the colony instead of just the carbohydrate sources? Unless they did take some of the brood, but compared to the honey sources, uh, the the, con the quantity was inconsequential. Well, I'll go back to the thing Roger told me about. There was a lot of honey stored in those colonies, and then suddenly— like you said, honey and pollen quit coming in, and they had a bunch of hungry mouths to feed, and they did had no way to feed them. Um, they, they could feed them honey, but, you know, you need more than that. You need a protein source. So uh, what you said makes sense in a way, and I'm certainly going to watch for it. And I, I'm thinking anybody listening here might want to watch for it, too, and see just not only take a look at what's outside the hive, but take a look at what's going on in the brood nest. Yes, I, I agree. I've seen this all through the years. There's a, you know, there's a, a pupae on the landing board. How many pupae? I don't know. Three. Not a problem. Don't worry about it. Well, there's actually a, a good reason why that pupae was out there. In many cases, partially eaten. Well, they broke it up, pulling it out of the cell. I don't know. Or was it partially eaten? The whole point is, Kim, I've never really looked at this until the question came up, and it made me sit around thinking for a few days, trying to come up. And the, the thing that I do know for sure is that cannibalism inside the hive is fairly routine. 
If something isn't right, they get they get eaten, they get tossed, they get pulled out of the system. They're not going to invest the energy in them. It happens to it happens to it happens to drones. It happens to developing queens that aren't necessary because other queens emerged first and the other queens were torn down, thrown up. I don't think that they're snacked on, but bees killing bees, bees eating bees, kind of a dirty world in there, isn't it, Kim? Well, it kind of takes, the, let's see, air out of the balloon of gentle bees. Yeah, it really <laughs> does. <laughs> so when you see a bee on a blossom, she's got a real sordid history, boy. <laughs> she was Maybe fed. she's lucky she's there. <laughs> right. She was lucky she wasn't eaten as a developing, like her siblings were, and used to feed her. Yep, yep. But it's, it's crystal clear, Kim. It was an interesting thought that I had on how this cannibalistic procedure lets the bees adjust to the vagaries of the, of the season. So all of a sudden it turns cold, just like it did here recently. I know my bees have brooded up. Maple was in full bloom, and then kaboom, back to 16 degrees. And I made the thought, well, I sure hope my bees have some reserves left out there. If I go open them, it's going to cause all kinds of grief, so just leave them alone and hope for the best. Well, if they're dealing with that inside that dark, cold hive, they're making some life-and-death decisions for the colony that result in the death of some of the developing larvae there. You know, the thing is, you probably could stop it before it starts or slow it down once it does start by putting on a couple of protein patties. That was the last thing on my list. <laughs> that was the last thing on my discussion list here today. Should we really take these protein patties seriously? Will, will protein patties help bees during a pollen dearth? Now, I don't think they will help during a disease situation. But during a pollen dearth, I mean, I put them on anyway. So have I been doing the right thing, or is that how helpful is that? Can't go wrong, so I guess that could be a dangerous recommendation that you and I are considering, not making, but considering. Put on a pollen patty. It's a guess. 60 feet away, it makes perfect sense. Getting closer to it, I'm not so yep. sure. But 60 yep. feet away, it makes perfect sense. Have it and don't need it rather than don't have it and have a bunch of dead bees out in front of your colony. Well, I think I've punched this out. I may come back to this later on as I, you know, it depends on how long my curiosity holds up. But this much I'm sure of, bees will eat their offspring in times of extreme need. And the questions just flow like water. Which larvae are eaten? How long? How extreme was the need? Which nurse bee made the decision? Was it a pollen protein shortage or was it a disease issue? How do the bees actually eat that larvae? I mean, it's an interesting to me, an interesting discussion that I don't have a lot of answers to, except this is common. We all allude to it and we all move right on. You know, listening to you here, one more thought came to my mind, and that was extreme, what's the word I want? Extreme cleaning behavior. Yeah. A, a, a house bee stuck her head in that cell and said, there's Varroa mite larva in here along with this bee larva. If I pull the bee larva out, I've already gotten, I already can get rid of three or, you know, two or three Varroa at the same time. I think you're onto something because one of the quick papers I read was that this whole process of eating is a house cleaning process. If, if the larvae is dead or dying and the nurse bee perceives that, better to eat it now before it dies and has something sporulate or mole growth occur. So for hive hygienity, colony hygienity, get that thing out of here right away. All right, we've got four good answers on the table. Which one do you want? We have four good <laughs> ones on the table? <laughs> I thought we had four poorly thought ideas on the table. <laughs> I'm going to go with the bees are eating selected young that they have not yet made a great investment in in times of extreme dearth, number one. Number two, it looks like bees that can perceive a, a a pathogenic situation 
are either eating or destroying various stages, probably larval, that are a, a danger to the health of the colony. And then lastly, it, it could be nothing more than what Kim Flotham said, extreme hive hygienic behavior. But bees will kill each other. I don't ever want to be a drone and a beehive. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> everything right. you do results in your death. If you're successful in mating, you die. If you're not <laughs> successful in mating, you're kicked out of the colony and you die. <laughs> if you're not needed and there's plenty of drones and there's a dearth, you die. I mean, do you see a basic trend for a drone? So I don't want to be a drone and a beehive. Yeah, I think I, think I got you there. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know if we got this answered or not, but it, it, it'll get me to look for some things later this season and maybe maybe see if I can talk to somebody that knows more about it than I do. I enjoyed the conversation. I wish I knew more for the listeners, but if, think about it and see how we can come up, what we can come up with here. Before we go, can I remind you of something? There's, there's a new blog on uh, growingplanetmedia.com. It's our, mother's, our mother company's webpage. And it's on, basically what it's on is climate change and what it's going to do to bees, beekeeping, and beekeepers. I'm kind of looking at uh, a specialized part of this. But take a look. Um, let, me, let us know what you think. I enjoy talking to you, buddy. Till next time. Till next time. Bye-bye.